Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Platek, and I'm TCAF's Marketing and Communications Manager. I'd like to sincerely welcome you all to the first ever virtual Toronto, Toronto Comic Arts Festival. We are so excited to have you join us today as we welcome you to a very special presentation with creator Molly Knox Ostertag. Before we begin, the Toronto Comic Arts Festival would like to honor and acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. We are in a territory that was the subject of the Dish, Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to share and care for the land. We also acknowledge that this area is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As a resident of Toronto, I'd like to recognize the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples in this area for time immemorial. This is also a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. I am truly grateful for this land and all that, ha it, all that it has provided to me. TCAF makes this acknowledgement as a reminder that we are all treaty people and that we have a responsibility to the land and each other. This acknowledgement is a touchstone in our process of thinking through what it means to live and work on colonized land and is an expression of solidarity with our Indigenous siblings. TCAF commits to strengthening its relationship with Indigenous communities in Toronto and increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives in our programming. And now I am happy to introduce you to Molly's editor at Scholastic, Amanda Maciel. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's so it's such an honor to be here, especially with Molly Knox Ostertag, uh, the author, the New York Times bestselling author of the Witch Boy trilogy, uh, which is the Witch Boy, the Hidden Witch and the Midwinter Witch, and the new book, Girl from the Sea, which I have my, my galley here at home in Brooklyn. Um, Molly, it's it's been just an utter joy to work on this book with you. Uh, it's been a long journey, as most graphic novels are, but it's really developed over the years. And, uh, and I think what better way to start than to throw it to you to tell us a little bit about the book and what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that very sweet introduction. And I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be at TCAF. TCAF is absolutely my favorite comic convention and I, I dearly miss being able to walk the aisles. So I, I am really looking forward to a future when I can see everyone in person again. And this book especially is set in um, the east coast of, of Canada and it just is like very, it's all very close to my home. So I really hope you guys like it. Um, so, so to give a little summary of The Girl from the Sea, um, so Morgan Kwan is 15 years old and she has her whole life planned out. Sure, she lives on this like tiny little island in Nova Scotia. Her parents are divorced. Her, her little brother is kind of like going crazy. Her mom is really sad. Things at home are tough, but Morgan has things figured out. She has a plan. She's going to get off of this tiny island, go to college somewhere far away. She's going to study her passion, which is fashion design. And only when she's away from her friends and her family will she be able to come out as gay. She just, it would just be too much drama to do so beforehand. Um, however, as most plans do, uh, a wrench is thrown in the works when Morgan meets Kelty. Kelty is a exuberant, earnest, sweet uh, girl who claims to be a selkie. She says that she's half seal and has come out of the ocean shedding her seal skin in order to have a grand epic romance with Morgan. Of course, Morgan cannot handle this at all. Um, and so she is trying to push Kelty away, but also kind of falling for her because Kelty is sweet and cute and is everything that she has ever, that Morgan has ever wanted. And so this book kind of is about this. It's a story of first love. It's a story of coming out. It's a story about friends and family. Um, and uh, it's a story about secrets. Both Morgan and Kelty have these secrets that are um, going to sort of bubble up throughout the book and, and come out and cause drama. So yeah, that's kind of my, my summary. It's a, it's a technically a YA book, so it's a little bit older than my previous work on The Witch Boy, which was fun because I got to kind of draw some like making out and stuff. Um, but uh, uh, I, I really hope that it will appeal to readers of all ages. And I think it's a pretty, a pretty relatable story for people who are pretty young and people who are older. 
I couldn't agree more. And that's uh, perfectly summarized. Thank you. I would really love to start with the setting, which you mentioned. Um, Morgan lives on a small island off the coast of Nova Scotia. Um, on the one hand, this is such a strong, excellent narrative choice uh, for a character who feels trapped. And, um, and on the other, it was also a little bit autobiographical, right? It, um, you based it off of a real place that you've really been. Yeah, yeah. And so it's funny, I don't know if you remember this, Amanda, but I, when we were finishing up the Witch Boy series, you really wanted like something autobiographical from me. Um, and I, I tried really hard. I think it turns out that that is a skill I do not have. And I, I respect deeply people who can take their life experience and put it into a narrative. Um, I, just, I just like couldn't wrap my brain around it. But I really did want to make something that was a little bit more grounded, a little bit more set in a place I was familiar with. Um, and so I set it on Wilniff Island. Um, it's this beautiful, very, very small island, access to the main, access to the mainland by like a little footbridge. There's no plumbing, there's no Wi-Fi, no cell service. Um, and my parents would um, spend all of our summers up there. So my parents are both teachers, they would have the summers off. And so them and me and my sister would go up there and spend a couple months on Wilnef Island every year. And it was so magical, especially as a little kid. It's just so beautiful. It's about I think like an hour and a half from Halifax, that's the biggest city. It's close to Ludenburg, um, which you probably know if you're Canadian, like this gorgeous little coastal town um, that's been very preserved. And it was just, it was, it was beautiful and it was magical, but it was also very isolated. And mm -hmm. as I got older, especially as I, I like got to be like 12 and 13 and 14, it started to feel really, really restrictive and lonely because I didn't know a ton of kids up there. There weren't really a lot of kids around. Um, and so that kind of loneliness in the, in the face of such a beautiful place was, was definitely something I was pulling on in Girl from the Sea and kind of the way that you don't really, even if you're in the most beautiful place in the world, if you grew up there and you spend all your time there, you don't necessarily appreciate it. So yeah. sort of a part of the story, you know, Kelty, she's this creature from the sea. She, she sort of represents the ocean and represents wildness in a way. And I think that she sort of helps Morgan start to like re-engage with this beautiful place that she lives and mm -hmm. to really sort of connect with the, the land and the creatures and the culture of her town. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I, you know, I, I, I sort of stopped going up to Nova Scotia at, at a certain point in my life because I was like, I'm a teenager now. I really want to stay. I can like drive. So I'm going to go to summer camp and see friends. And like, I, I don't want to go be stuck on this island without internet for all summer. Um, and then at a certain point, I, so I really didn't appreciate it. And then at a certain point, um, I brought my now wife to visit my parents' island and um, their reaction to it, at, to the beauty and to like seeing all these things for the first time made me really appreciate it for the first time as well, or for, it, it helped me reappreciate it. And so that's kind of the journey that I think Morgan and Kelsey go on a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what you said about feeling isolated, that part of adolescence is so isolating too. Um, so to feel cut off um, on an island in the, yeah. It, yeah. it really shines through on, on so many levels. And yeah. then there's also the, the theme throughout of secrets. Um, mm -hmm. Morgan and Kelty are each hiding a lot from from each other, from everyone um, about their true identities. I mean, Kelty's a little bit more forthcoming, at least with Morgan, but not about everything. And um, and again, I love how this inter interacts with the setting and uh, like the way that things can be hidden under the sea, um, and uh, and how small islands and, <laughs> and little brothers, which Morgan has. Um, can make you really have to carve out your own sense of self and privacy um, so that you have room to kind of be yourself in a way that you're comfortable with. But tell me about how secrets sort of inform the story and then how the truth also, the, that balance um, yeah. came through as you were developing these characters. Yeah, yeah, I think um, secrets are very much in this story, for Morgan especially, it's a, a means of control. Um, I think when you are this age, you don't have a lot of control over your life and you're just starting to get old enough to realize like what your life would look like if you had control over it. Mm -hmm. And so for Morgan, part of that is keeping this part of herself secret. Um, I, I really wanted, so, so something that I really wanted to do with this book was tell a story of coming out and being gay and being young, but I really didn't want to rely on homophobia for the drama. 
Um, it's not a part of my experience. I was really lucky to go up in a very liberal area and I, I just didn't, I, I wanted to sort of explore what reasons a person would have to stay closeted even when they are not, you know, afraid of backlash from their friends and family, which is sort of my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it is just, it's so much about the fact that this information about yourself is very vulnerable. It's like appearing naked. It's like you're showing this naked, sort of vulnerable, sort of new part of yourself. And it's really scary. It's like the people around mm -hmm. you that know more about you than you maybe want them to know. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you live in a small town like Morgan does. Um, and, you know, obviously like I didn't grow up in Nova Scotia, but I, I lived in a very small, like rural town that also kind of had this feeling. Um, so I was drawing on that a bit where you just, you know, everyone, everyone's known you since you were a little kid. And it's so it, sort of like, like anything that changes people's perception of you is very scary. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the idea around Morgan's secrecy is that she's just trying to sort of hold on to a little bit of control in her life. And um, she's, you know, her family is a little chaotic, her parents divorced, her dad is gone, her brother is having these like crazy temper tantrums and really making the house a really, really stressful place. Mm -hmm. um, and Morgan just wants to like be able to keep this like one thing to herself and keep it sort of like in a little box. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, this gets complicated as she and Kelsey start to have real feelings for each other and start to be together because you can't sort of love someone and, and be in a relationship with them and keep them a secret. It's, it's ultimately cruel. Um, and so sort of exploring the way that both secrets can be a means of control, but also when they start to involve other people um, they become this like block between you and other people. So Morgan is really cut off from her family. She's really checked out of her family life. She doesn't want to deal with any of it. She's not really trusting her friends. She's she's like like having these opinions about them and not really wanting to share herself with them because she just doesn't doesn't want them to see that side of herself. And I think like sort of part of the book is that it's, you start to see how that affects her friends and her family and how they feel really distant from her without mm -hmm. even the reason why they just feel like she's been far away for a long time. And then mm -hmm. when she finally sort of release the secret, it lets her become a lot closer to the people that matter in her life. Right, right. And and Kelty has her secrets, but I, I love that she's not, she's so, she really accepts who she is in this way, and she's like proud of who she is as a Selkie, and uh, and I love how that helps Morgan open up too to, um, to the facets of herself as well. There's a very fun sort of little metaphor in there. So so if people, not everyone knows about Selkie mythology. So Selkies are they spend their lives as seals, um, but they're like they sort of have human souls, and they can come onto land and take off their seal skins. Sometimes it's whenever they want. In my book, it's um, every seven years they get the chance to sort of take off their seal skin. Um, and uh, so I really like, I love stories about shapeshifters. I have shapeshifters in the witch boy too, in kind of like all of my comics, there's like something with that. Cause I just find that idea very compelling. Um, but I think it's, there's a line where sort of Kelsey realizes that, or observes that like, even though she changes the way she looks and she changes her form, she's always herself. Well, Morgan, who is just an ordinary human girl really is one way with her friends, one way with her family and another way with Kelsey. Um, and Morgan is kind of doing this act of shape-shifting um, that's like, like kind of parallel to Kelty's. So yeah, it's, it's, Kelty definitely has her own secrets. And I feel like I haven't been talking about that as much in promo because I, I like want that part of the story to like unfold as people are reading it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I like the idea that she, she's here and she has things that she wants and things that she sort of needs from her time on land. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she kind of, the things that she needs will sort of pull Morgan into having to be braver in order to help this person that she loves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely no spoilers. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if you would share with us, thinking about shape-shifting made me wonder if, if there's a particular animal that you would shift into yourself, if you could, or if that like changes a given any given day or... Oh man, you know, I, I mean, I think a seal would be really fun because they have so much fun, but I think my like favorite creature is an otter. Um, we went to Big Sur, which is like up north on the California coast um, a couple months ago to camp and we saw a bunch of otters out in the water, like just playing and, and swimming around. So I think, yeah, a playful little sea creature would definitely be my vibe. <laughs> yeah. That was definitely, well, like, that's always like, if I could have a superpower, it would always be to like 
turn into some kind of animal because I just think it's it would be cool. <laughs> it's a really good one. And what was it what was it about Selkies that felt appropriate for the story that you were telling about Morgan? I know it's kind of hard to like parse those things out because it sort of develops all together, but did it feel like that was I, I don't was it the setting that that kind of or did you start with Selkies and then kind of yeah. work your way back? Um, I think it was the setting at first. So, so we, we had this like tiny little house on an island and my parents are really outdoorsy. They love to kayak especially. And so we would do lots of kayaking trips and there was a reef that was like a 20 minute sort of kayak out from the island, like out into the ocean. And there's a reef and it was, had like a pod of seals that lived there. And so that was very inspiring to me. And, um, like on foggy days, you could sort of hear them barking and like, kayak out and they would like come up and like stick their heads up and they were they were pretty pretty cool with people so they would get really close and you would see like their babies and stuff um and so I think like feeling that kind of like connection to those those creatures um my my dad would when I was really little would like make up stories that one of them was my friend and he'd be like that's that's your friend his name was like Septenarius um and he would be like there he is like do you see him um and so that kind of stuck with me as the I think when you are, live near the ocean there's this sort of myths around the ocean are always really interesting because they're about how anything could happen out there. It's this big mysterious place and you could go out, anything could happen to you, anything could come out of the ocean. And so for me, that was like, what if one of those seals was a person? And what if in these sort of lonely summers, they like came onto land and became my friend. So that was kind of a persistent fantasy for me as a kid. And so it was like tapping into that very imaginative yearning that I had, I guess, that um, that really kind of uh, uh, made me connect to the Selkie legend when I learned mm -hmm. about it. Um, I also, like, Selkie legends are also so interesting to me. They're often a, um, the classic legend is often this, like, metaphor for either losing someone at sea. So, like, the, the way it basically goes is that the Selkie woman com comes onto land, she takes off her seal skin to sunbathe, um, and then a human man will steal the seal skin. And that means that she has to be his wife. She has to bear him children. And she's always like a really good wife, a really good mother, but she's always yearning for the sea. And at a certain point, she re she finds her seal skin where her husband hid it and she puts it on and goes back into the ocean and never comes back. And so I think it's like, there's sort of two metaphors in that fairy tale. There's both the idea of losing someone at sea and this kind of mystery of never knowing what one day they're there, the next day they're gone and you don't know what happened to them. And then there's also kind of this like sort of domestic abuse, a sort of being forced into a relationship, being forced into a role. You do not want to play having this piece of yourself kept from you, physically kept from you, so that you cannot go back and see your family. You cannot go back to like the ocean, which is your home. Um, so when I was reinterpreting it and doing sort of a, a queer retelling of a selfie myth, I knew that I wanted to sort of change that up and change up the idea of um, uh, sort of like keeping the seal skin and everything. And again, I don't want to like, like spoil too much, but it, it's, it was very important to me to explore the idea of like giving someone their seal skin back and giving back their agency. Um, and so mm -hmm. how that kind of is like this, this, it's both like a queer version of the selfie myth, but it also is this more modern, um, reinterpreted sort of, sort of healthier, uh, story. Yeah, I love that. I love that that's all in there. And yet, I don't think we ever specifically talked about that before. That's yeah. amazing. Sometimes I that I did, like, once it's already done and I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, that's so smart. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. Look at all those layers you just put in there. Um, you said you we have talked before, and, and I know you've said elsewhere how personal this book was for you. Uh, beyond just the setting. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that. Um, I think you've already spoken to it a little bit, but um, if you could tell us what it was like writing a more, it's even if it wasn't an autobiographical uh, novel, whatever that means, but um, I, what it was like to sort of tap a little closer to home. Yeah, um, it was really vulnerable and it felt really scary. I think there's, um, an interesting thing when you are a queer person making work, um, the closer it hits to your own identity, the, the more scary it is because mm -hmm. I think we all sort of have this fear that we are like doing our identities wrong, um, which is like, of course, nonsense, but it's, it's very, very prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, and so telling like an actual lesbian love story and sort of telling this like 
romance that I, I wish like this sort of summer fling that I wish I'd been, been okay with myself and I wish I could have had when I was a teen. Um, it was really, it was really scary. And there were definitely certain parts where I just was sort of questioning myself and like trying to figure out like what exactly I was doing with it. Um, but I, I think in the end, really letting myself be very self-indulgent with it and letting myself just tap into these kind of often very sweet, soft, um, you said in a review they called it sapphic fluff, which I was like, that's great. I love it. <laughs> um, but like tapping into these feelings and then it's like both the sweetness and then also the drama um, and also the kind of the kind of tension between like like the person that you really care about who makes you feel so good and then how that translates into the rest of your life. Um, that was very, very pulled from personal experiences and from this kind of feeling of of knowing who you want to be with and having it be so easy when you're together and then everything else that's complicated and having to kind of work that out um, and these like different kind of inadequate ways to cope with that situation um yeah so that was definitely personal i as i said like i was i was interested in exploring a story of a closeted teen who was not afraid of homophobia not afraid of being kicked out um I really did sort of go back to this very vulnerable place and think about when I was like 14 and 15 and 16 and in high school and like having sleepovers with girls and not even like necessarily having like an attraction to my friends, but just knowing that this was a part of myself and feeling like if I admitted that I would set myself apart from them. Um, and that I kind of would almost like this fear of like, like it's horrible to say, but like the fear of being like a wolf in a hen house kind of, and just being like, like I'm different from you. I am like potentially like a predator to you. And, and that was so scary. And I don't know where I absorbed that from again. Cause like it's, it wasn't from my family but it's something that you get from culture. And I, that, so that really made me kind of push down those feelings for a long time and to really be like Morgan and be like, well, I just don't have to act or acknowledge these things. I don't have to share it with anyone. It can stay inside me and that's where it will be safe. Um, and so it, it, yeah, yeah, that was like definitely a place that was really interesting to go back and realize how many memories I had around that, that I kind of had, had maybe sort of like pushed down because they just weren't, um, it was just sort of upsetting to kind of access that part of myself, but I feel like I am now confident and like, like out and very like very secure in myself. So I can sort of go back to that much more vulnerable time. And um, I don't know, both be like sympathetic to myself and also be like, here's what I wish you would have done differently. Yeah, yeah, I really, I think the book, those things that Morgan is going through feel so real. And yet there's so much joy and softness in the story, in the art, in the book. It's just such a, um, it's so beautiful and it, and it doesn't feel um, judge. I mean, it really feels like you're coming at it from a, a real place of strength and, uh, and compassion um, yeah. and, and joy, which is such a, such a lovely thing to experience when you're reading it. Um, yeah. If you had had this book when you were, if you'd found it in high school or younger even, what, can you, can you even think like what a book like this would have meant to you at the time? Or do you think you would have maybe like compartmentalized it along with um, everything else? I feel like I have so many memories of, of media with lesbians in it. And I just, my brain would do like a little like busy noise signal. Um, <laughs> like, oh gosh, I forget. It's some like classic 80s fantasy that's all about like lesbian warriors fighting together. Um, and I definitely remember reading that and just being like, I do not comprehend this section of the book. Like, file not <laughs> Um, well, I don't know, but I think I, I think the kids now are like a lot smarter <laughs> and a lot more um, kind of open and aware of like the many different ways that people can can exist and like identify and have relationships. And so mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where I, I wanted to, I did, I really wanted to show the joy, the joyful aspect of it. And I wanted to show the, the drama of it. And, and I wanted it, like it is this like very classic love story. It's not just like sunshine and rainbows. Um, Cause I feel like I sometimes feel very distanced from stories like that as well that are queer when I see this like perfectly happy, perfectly bubbly, no homophobia, no problems. I'm like, okay, but like, I want, I want a story that shows both the, the incredible joy, but then also the fact that that joy is in context of um, fear and of shame. And that like the point of pride is that we like are told to be ashamed of ourselves. And so that's something that I just, I hope that I can like make, make kids feel like better about themselves if they, if they read it. Um, and uh, just sort of be like a lovely, 
like entertaining story for them also that they can kind of see themselves represented in. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you're also writing a novel, so you need some conflict and some <laughs> stuff going on too. Um, like, <laughs> there's yeah. so much discourse around uh, like queer queer suffering in media, and it's it's right. very so much of it is so much of like what we're aware of has been written by straight cis writers, and so mm -hmm. they often are like the only way I can imagine a lesbian on TV is like to to die. And so it's it was really fun to be like, okay, I know that I don't have any of those hangups. Um, but let me approach it and still bring in drama and still like get to see these characters having conflicts um, over these things that really matter. Um, yeah, it was super fun. Exactly, exactly. And it's also character driven. It's not about yeah, the yeah. society. Um, let's talk about the art. It was really fun to watch the characters develop over time. And as you as you kind of got to know them and were revising. Um, Tell me a little bit about the, tell me about that, about how Morgan and Kelty specifically kind of developed for you as you drew. Yeah, they were, so I felt like I kind of had this like, I think it might be in the back of the book in the extra section, but I had this epiphany when I was doodling them. I like will sit with my iPad and watch TV and doodle a lot in the evening. And I realized that Morgan, she's like, she's very thin, she's very tall. She has all these like hard angles. And I was like, she is very rigid. That's her personality. And then Kelty is, curvy she has like giant eyes her hair is wild she's covered in all these random freckles everywhere and she is really wild and really chaotic and kind of realizing that that visual like then was also the di dynamic of the characters is one of those things that's just so magical about comics so it's one of those things where i i sort of knew what the story was but i hadn't i wasn't quite getting into the characters heads yet and then when i drew that and i just drew like i think it is just like a drawing of morgan being really stiff and then Kelty trying to pull her into a dance and Kelty's all loose and like wavy and crazy looking. Um, that was when I was like, oh, that's the heart of the book. Um, and definitely in the section I'm going to read, that's kind of like the, the fun of that, of the section I'm about to read. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, the art was really fun. And I've been, besides working in comics, I've been um, in animation, working in animation for the last um, however many years. And uh, I've even not been drawing an animation, I've been writing. And mm -hmm. it's really fun to just be around other artists and see the way people are drawing movement and drawing character. Um, I feel like it's it's this interesting sort of passive learning where I've sometimes had these really long stretches in between books where I didn't draw at all. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I sit down to draw, I found that I've learned so much because I'm just working with other people who are visual artists. So mm -hmm. it was kind of cool to sit down and especially start to, to start inking this book and be like, oh, I really have these like, I don't know, skills that I, I didn't I didn't have on like the last Witch Boy book and it kind of came from just like the environment that I was working in. That's really cool. I also, I love how you draw clothes and outfits. I'm always, I'm always jealous of the outfits, um, but those are also really thoughtful and clearly um, come from the characters and then like turn and inform the characters. Does, does thinking about that part of their expression and like you were saying about like having control over your self, your environment, your your life um, as a teenager specifically is pretty limited and closes one of those ways. And of course, Morgan is into fashion uh, as a person too. But um, does that help you? Like, do you doodle outfits to kind of figure out who the girls are? Or um, do you think about that? More? Yeah, I, I, usually the clothes come from a lot of research. Um, mm -hmm. So this was like looking at like Forever 21 and like Shine and Pinterest and like pulling all of these outfits um, and trying to figure out like what like kids are wearing now, which of course changes all the time. So I'm sure it's outdated, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it was really fun as a character exercise because Morgan is more creative than she lets on. She loves mm -hmm. making clothes, but they always, as she says in the book, they always look too weird to wear. So she doesn't wear them. She's like this very constructed image. And when she kind of like Kelty shows up on her doorstep, she's wearing like this giant raincoat and nothing else. And Morgan's like, okay, the first thing we have to fix is your clothes. We have to make sure your presentation is together because Morgan is this master of disguise in a way. Mm -hmm. And so it was cool, especially as the book goes to start seeing her like change her fashion a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think by the end, um, she like, like, uh when she is like a little bit more free and more out she wears this like really cool dress and that was that took me the longest to design and mm -hmm. it was really when I realized that like oh she is this is sort of her coming out look and like it has to be a bit more artsy and a bit more interesting than the other stuff that she wears and then I kind of had a design for it um 
but yeah, I, I love drawing clothes. Um, I love wearing clothes <laughs> and a big part of <laughs> a big part of the inspiration for Morgan's like fashion, um, hobby is, is Project Runway, Project Runway Junior. Yeah. Um, only two seasons it's so good but I just love seeing teens like making clothes and like a bunch of them were queer and I love seeing how they were expressing themselves through their fashion so yeah yeah I, I, have to, I love clothes and how they tie into character that's one thing I've missed so much since quarantine began is uh because the scholastic offices are in Soho and just commuting being in Manhattan being in different neighborhoods all day I would just see different outfits and different expressions and different ages. And it's been I'm kind of sitting in my apartment being like, please don't change everything while I'm stuck in here. I'm sorry, I'm my phone. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'll get back to it. Real life inspiration is sorely missing right now. Yeah, it was very fun to be drawing it. I feel so, it was so, such a good escape to be drawing this at the beginning of the pandemic because mm -hmm. I just, date to Nova Scotia and draw these like parties and fun times and beautiful nature and it was it was really escapist for me and it was it was really um good for my my brain <laughs> during a hard time yeah. yeah it was I mean it was such a gift to work on this book over the over the last year um for similar reasons um I feel like we have to wrap up pretty quickly uh, this has really flown by thank you again so much for just for, I mean, for the book, I'm just going to hold it up again because I have it here and I love it so much. Um, and for the story and and for digging so deep and working so long and so hard on making it just, it's just perfect. It really is just such a beautiful experience in, in every possible way. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry, there's a garbage truck outside. <laughs> um, but thank you. I, I, I so appreciate like your, your vision on this book was so, you were so, so helpful. And like, you know, it went through so many drafts and like, I literally drew like 50 pages and then I had to scrap it because I, it wasn't quite working in it. It's just, it's been, it's been really, it's been really good to like, feel like I had you in my, my corner. Um, well, I feel especially, I brought the witch boy to you, but this is the first one that we kind of like, I was like, here's a little idea. Let's start talking about it. It was, it was really fun. So yeah. Well, I I've, I've said it before, but I you make my job incredibly easy because, uh -huh. and I and I love how you really are so story focused. You really get that right, and you you know are so thoughtful every step of the way. But um, but yeah, you're I mean you're a genius. So I can't really take any credit whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you for joining me and for um, letting me fangirl yet again. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I can't wait for everybody to read this book. It is just, yeah. we've, you know, just with the galleys, we've been getting so many glowing reviews coming in from booksellers, from, uh, from readers. So I just, it, it, June can't come fast enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to share it. Okay, so yeah, I'm really excited to now share a reading of the first um, 30 or 40 pages of the book. And I just want to call out that the cover was designed by Shivana Sikdeo and Phil Falco. And the interior colors are by Marta Laiho, who did an amazing job bringing the atmosphere of the story to life. So um, shout out, a graphic novel is always a collaboration between many people. So thank you so much for your work on this. So <clears throat> the girl from the sea. So we start with a little group chat. Morgan, Serena, Jules, and Lizzie are all here. And Serena is taking charge of the group chat. It's June 11th, it's nine in the evening. Okay, ladies, now that summer vacation has officially begun, meet me in town tomorrow. It's a surprise. Jules is like, I'm there. We have been cleaning grandma's house for a week and I'm so bored. And she's interrupted by Lizzie saying, I have to work. Serena's like, when? Liz, no, 12, 12 to eight. Serena's like, okay, so we'll meet at like 10 at Iggy's. Morgan, you in? Lizzie yells, Morgan. Jules whispers in a creepy ghost whisper, Morgan. A little time passes and Jules is like, ah, oh, guess she's dead. That's it, she's dead. Rip to Morgan. Lizzie's like, no, don't be horrible. But no one else responds to the chat. And it's a little bit later, Serena and Morgan in a, in a group chat off to the side. Serena texts Morgan, we're meeting at Figgy's tomorrow at 10. Are you okay? The thing is, she's not okay. We open on a shot of Morgan Kwan sinking through the water, sinking into um, uh, seaweed and darkness. She's thinking as she does so. It's true, you know. 
the whole thing about your life flashing before your eyes, bubbles of water start escaping from her mouth as she has memories of her life. I like to keep my life tucked neatly into boxes, but the boxes have been dropped in the ocean and now everything is spilling out. And we see a big page of little snippets from her life. We see her holding her little brother. We see her parents laughing. We see her older running with her little brother. One box holds everything from when I was little. Mom and dad still together. Aiden still fun to be around. Everything made sense then. Now we see her friends from the group chat. Another box is my life at school, my friends and the person I am around them. She doesn't say things unless she knows other people will agree. She's good at blending in. We see this little house on an island, the rain hitting the roof. And then there's life at home. Dad moved to the city after months of arguments. He and mom thought we couldn't hear. Aiden started getting mad about everything. I can't even look at him anymore. Every moment I'm home, I want to escape. And we see Morgan kind of storming out of the house as her little brother and her mom are in a fight. She's pulling on this orange raincoat. The cliffs are my quiet place, but tonight the rocks were slippery from the rain and we see her slipping off the cliffs into the water. So I hit my head and now I'm here and I can't stop thinking of the last secret box. My big plans. And she tries to swim. We see a little bit of blood leaking from the cut on her head. She tries to swim through the water to get off this island and move to the city, any city, to go to college and to be gay far away from this tiny town and everyone who's known me since forever. And we see a couple more bubbles of air ex uh, escaping her mouth as she sinks back in the water. She, um, we see her perspective. She's seeing sort of the ocean rocks looming around her. The surface of the water is so far above her. I thought if I planned carefully enough, it would happen. But now, now I'm in the water and I can see that future spinning away and I want to grab it, but I can't tell which way is up. And with the final few air bubbles, Morgan sinks from view. That's it, that's the book. Just kidding. Um, she opens her eyes in surprise um, as arms close around her and she is swum to the top of the surface really quickly. Her head breaks through the water and she gasps in air. She pulls herself onto the shore, coughs out all the water in her lungs. And when she looks up breathing heavily, she's startled ah! <laughs> to see this girl leaning out of the water casually just looking at her. She has wild, crazy hair and giant dark eyes, and she's staring right at Morgan. It's not a good night for you to swim, Morgan Kwan. Morgan stares at her, a blush kind of faintly on her cheeks. She's thinking, okay, naked girl, this is an entirely different kind of stressful situation. The girl just looks at her and uh, Morgan sort of shyly ducks away. I, I wasn't swimming on purpose. Um, the girl jumps out of the sea, kind of getting closer to Morgan. Do you remember me? Because I remember you. And she stares at Morgan so closely. Morgan's not sure. She is familiar, like a person in a dream. Oh. And Morgan kind of laughs a little dizzy. This is a, a near-death experience hallucination, isn't it? Cute. The girl's concerned, checking the cut on Morgan's head. Are you feeling all right? You hurt your head. Never better, says Morgan. You know, since this is a dream, it might as well be a romantic one. The girl laughs, romantic. Morgan inches a little bit closer. Just a thought. So this is all in your head then? Mm-hmm. And Morgan reaches out to take the girl's face. You're way too cute to be real. And then they're kissing, the girl in the water, Morgan on the land, the cold ocean all around them. It's a little bit later. Morgan's mom is sitting and reading. She's kind of pissed off. Morgan looks through the window gathering herself before coming into the house. She creaks in the door, takes off her boots quietly. That you, Morgan? Her mom calls from the living room. Yeah, says Morgan, sort of using her hair to hide the cut on her head. I'm sorry about tonight, her mom says. Aiden's just working through his feelings. I know it's stressful. Morgan is not having this. You always make excuses for him. Her mom is just quiet, looking down sadly. Morgan turns away. Good night, mom. We're in Morgan's room. Her wet clothes are a puddle on the floor. She checks the bump on her head. She jumps into bed with a big thump. She checks her phone, this message from Selena. We're meeting at Figgy's tomorrow, you okay? She texts back quickly, I'm all good, see you then. The lights are off and she's just scrolling her phone, looking at random things, but she can't focus. She closes her eyes and remembers the girl or the dream or whatever it was. It wasn't real, she says to herself. I inhaled seawater and I had a nice dream or something like that. But she did remind me of something. 
and we see this little picture on her wall. It's young Morgan and her young brother. They're playing, um, running around on the islands. And suddenly we're back, we're in a memory. I was nine, so it must have been seven years ago. Come on, Aiden. And we see their dad is watching them. Morgan is wearing a little wetsuit, little floaties, and she's happy to be in the water. Aiden, not so happy. He's perched on the edge. He's wearing little kitty ears. Come on, Aiden. But kitties don't like the water. She tries to pull him in and he's meowing and hissing at her. She's laughing. Dad finally steps in, leave your brother alone. He sticks his tongue out at her and Morgan sort of holds her hands up defeated and does a backstroke out into the middle of the bay. She's surprised when someone pops up next to her all, all of a sudden. Do you like muscles? It's this little girl with giant black eyes, long blonde hair, and she looks kind of kind of weird. <laughs> Morgan splashes in surprise, turning to look at her. Um, I'm allergic to shellfish. Oh, well, because I could get you some if you like them. Morgan's curious, how? I'll show you, says the girl, taking her hand. She pulls her out farther into the water and starts to take off her water wings. Um, says Morgan, looking at them nervously. We have to dive for him, says the girl. I can't dive. Just trust me. And Morgan looks at her face, her big eyes, her friendly smile. She looks completely trustworthy. And so Morgan takes her hand and they dive beneath the water. They um, enter this sort of beautiful underwater kingdom and um, we see the gorgeous sort of uh, Pacific underwater. They're swimming around the edge of the, the bridge. They're swimming around the big pillars of the bridge. They see a crab, they see a scary lobster. Um, they're sort of laughing. There's these bubbles surrounding Morgan. It's almost like she can breathe um, even though she's, she's been under the water for ages. Um, Morgan sort of floats in place as the girl tells her to stay there. And all of a sudden a baby seal comes out from behind the pillar. The girl is gone, but there's this cute spotted seal. It swims around Morgan who looks at it happily. She reaches out to touch it. And then her dad crashes into the water. His arms wrap around her and he swims up with her frantically. Dad, I'm fine. You were under the water for way too long. I thought, her dad looks at her nervously, but I was following the girl. Aiden's watching from the bridge. He's nervous. Something sort of has shifted here. It's gotten dramatic. Uh, Morgan looks out trying to see her. There was a girl and then there was a seal. But as her dad says, there's no one there, Morgan. We go back to the present. Morgan stares at her ceiling, trying to understand what these memories could mean. She flips over, touching the bump on the side of her head. Mom's gonna kill me if I have brain damage. It's the next morning and Morgan is woken up by gulls calling on top of her roof. She opens one eye grumpily, she sees her clothes soaking wet still on the ground. So that proves that last night was not a dream, at least not all of it. She brushes her hair to cover the bump on her head and she goes downstairs. Her little brother is making cereal and her mom excitedly exclaims, you're up when she sees Morgan. It's not that late, says Morgan. Her mom is peppy. She's trying really hard to sort of smooth over the drama of last night. So here's what I'm thinking. Traffic at the museum is still slow, which means I can take the afternoon off because we haven't been to the beach yet this summer. She tosses Morgan a beach ball. We gotta enjoy it before all the tourists come. But Morgan just passes it to Aiden. I'm meeting Serena and everyone in town today. Aiden drops it. Well, I don't wanna go with just mom. Their mom looks a little offended, but tries to cover. Well, let's go soon. As Morgan's heading out, she says, will you take the compass out before you leave? Morgan's like, you know, the girls wouldn't scream all morning if we didn't feed them, but she goes out anyway. And finally, we see this big shot of the island where she lives. It's this tiny island. It's just their house and one other house connected to the mainland by a bridge. There's, um, it's very wild, but it's so isolated, so far from anything. We moved to Wilmoth Island from Toronto when I was little. It always felt special, but this is the first summer dad isn't here and now everything is just weird. She starts dumping out the compost for the gulls to eat and they start circling. In a few weeks, my job with the kayak rental is starting. So at least I'll have a reason to be out of the house. So that's it, that's all I got. And she sort of gestures to get the seagulls to, to fly away, go on. But as their wings sort of part, she realizes that she can see someone through them. It's the girl from last night. She's wearing this giant raincoat. She's walk barefoot walking on the land and she's waving enthusiastically at Morgan. Morgan stares at her in shock. Oh no, 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 no. And the girl starts running towards her like she's going to tackle her in a hug. Morgan doesn't know what to do. And then she fully wipes out and falls on the ground. Oh my God, are you okay? Morgan runs over quickly. Um, the girl is just cheerful though. She gestures at her legs. She's like, still not used to these yet. The ground is harder than I thought it would be. Morgan helps her up. 
what do you, um, who are you? It's me, Kelty. Morgan leans back. She, this girl is getting really in her personal space. I'm Morgan. I know. And Kelty has a big speech. Morgan, I am a Selkie and you are my true love. And your kiss has allowed me to transform from a seal into a human and walk on land. Now we can find our fortunes together. Morgan stares at her for a second, complete shock. And then, yeah, no, 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 we're not doing that. She starts shoving her away. But our destinies are intertwined, sealed by a kiss. That was a near-death experience hallucination. Uh, Kelty spins around, kind of suave, grabs Morgan's waist. I assure you it was not. Morgan grabs her hands, trying to, trying to sort of just keep a handle on the situation. She sees their neighbors across the islands. Hi, Earl. Hi, Val. Morgan and Kelty wave. Morgan looking nervously at Kelty, who just seems completely at ease in this situation. She sort of gets Kelty off of her. Enough with the touching. Morgan, that's her mom. Mom, who's your friend? Kelty looks happy. I'm Kelty, ma'am. Uh, want to come in for some breakfast? Kelty nods. Indeed. Morgan glares daggers at her. Um, she spins around as soon as her mom closes the door. What do you want? I told you, I'm here because of true love's kiss. It's the only thing that can let a selkie walk on land. None of those things are real, Morgan insists. Kelsey kind of glares at her. She is realizing this is going to be harder than she thought. I see I need to convince you. That's fair. How about a day? What? It did save your life last night. So in exchange, spend the day with me? Sunset, if you wish me to leave, I'll be gone. Morgan stares at her. Okay, this is the only way she's gonna get rid of her. Okay, fine. Before Kelty can go in though, she blocks the door. No talk about love or kissing at breakfast. None. You are my friend from school. Got it? And Kelty just boops her on the nose. And you are a very strange girl. And she walks in happily. Morgan is frazzled. This is already more than she can handle. Um, so that's it. That's, that's my reading. You can read the rest of Girl from the Sea um, on June 1st when it will, I assume, be in bookstores everywhere. And um, I, I really hope you enjoy it. It's kind of like, I feel like sometimes people read comics really fast. And so it's, it's fun to be like, no, here's like what's happening in every single panel. So yeah. take your time with it. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, it really comes through that you like it and, and you're good at it. Um, so I was looking at the Q&A uh, during the pre-recorded stuff and I, I tried to pick a couple of questions. We have about 15 minutes. So I wanted to pick some that it felt like maybe you didn't completely answer or didn't answer in, in our Q&A. Um, so let me see. I think it was Smilla was wondering um, how you feel like your style has evolved, particularly from the Witch Boy, you know, which was a whole trilogy. So I feel like your style kind of evolved over those books. But um, moving on to Girl from the Sea, do you want to talk yeah. about that a little? Yeah, um, I know it's so it's so cool having like that many books out that you can sort of see the style change. Um, but yeah, for, for this book, especially, I really wanted to do something a little bit more mature feeling. Um, I definitely spent longer on the art than I did the witch boy books I drew really fast, which I, I, I think is important when you're making graphic novels, for me, at least like I want to put out a lot of books. And so having a fast style um, really helps with that. But this book, I was like, it's, it's a standalone book. It's this romance that I am really invested in. And it's this place that I know so well. So there's all these details that I want to bring in. And so I definitely took my time with it. And um, I think I already said it in the Q&A earlier, but kind of working in animation at the same time as comics, just, it's like always introducing me to new ideas about drawing and ideas about putting characters together. So yeah, I think that this like, especially like I like love that scenes like that I read like where, where Kelty is like trying to get Morgan to agree that they're going to be in love forever and everything um there's like so much body language in that scene and so that was definitely something that I sort of took from animation realizing how much um this like motion even in a still image um can really sort of sell the characters and tell the story yeah. um yeah and then I definitely just I did a a lot more research for the clothes and the setting um but yeah, I mean, I think my, my interest in art is always to kind of make these characters that you look at and you feel, you can like feel the emotions that they're feeling. So that I think it's like, I've, I've always tried to do that. And I think I'm just continuing to like, like pursue that goal. Right, right. Yeah, there were two questions um, that kind of tied in together, but quickly, Isabella had, had talked about drawing hands and how <laughs> hard that is. And I know a long time ago, you said something about not really enjoying drawing cars. 
um, <laughs> if I remember correctly. But uh, but do you? I mean, I have to assume I'm not a visual artist, but um, I have to assume that just the practice and the you know just constantly going <laughs> back and doing it more and more must help yeah and, you know it's i'm i'm a huge things. you know comics are really hard and i'm a huge fan of choosing what you want to focus on and choosing what you like to draw and so <laughs> there are very few cars in my books i think there's one car in this book it's um that totally traced from a 3d model that i downloaded from sketchup i'm not ashamed to say that you probably can tell when you look at the drawing um i don't know how to stylize them it's not for me, it is not the priority. However, hands, to me, um, hands are like the key to romance um, in a lot of like visual art and even like descriptive, like movies and even prose. And so that I was like, I really know that this has to be right. And so I enjoy drawing them. There's a lot of character to them. Um, but I think that if you like are not having fun with it, you, there is so much art that like has really cartoony hands and that's also fine. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say I definitely did practice a lot. It's kind of fun because you can just look at your hands and like, put it into all these like different poses and draw it mm -hmm. um and uh yeah I suggest that the hardest thing to draw is like two hands like holding hands that's all it always looks weird but yeah um, important to try to get that sense of of tactileness um totally. to really tell a romance story totally Isabella yeah. was also asking about artist block but um and Blue Raven had said um like, do you have any creative rituals uh or focus techniques that you and I, I thought that those were kind of sort of related yeah. questions. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, it's like my advice, it, it, I can only ever say that it works for myself. Um, but I, I, I see a lot of people saying like, draw every day, write every day. And it, that does not work for me. I sort of need to have times when I'm on and I'm off. And so I have kind of had these like, I sort of try to just like pay attention to what I'm interested in and what is coming easily. And so if, if drawing is is the thing that is pleasurable, probably the more I do it, like I'll have a good stretch of a couple months where I'm like having good drawing days. It doesn't have to be every day. And then often after that period of like productivity, I will like not have good drawing days for a while. I think it's a pretty natural arc. And the same thing happens with writing. There's times when I am having lots of ideas and then there's times when I don't have any ideas. Um, and so I think like paying attention to that, trying to learn your own creative rhythms, which may not be, probably are not like mine, but trying to learn them in general. and not i think when you have those days that it's really really hard and it is painful and it feels like scraping like a raw nerve just to sit down at your computer or your drawing desk like i think i in my opinion you should really be gentle with yourself and like let yourself um step back from it because for me burnout has always happened when i had to really like dig in and draw even when i was like not feeling it at all so yeah i think just paying attention to your passions and then um sorry i talk about this in every panel but like last summer I got really obsessed with Lord of the Rings and I did like, I had like several months where I drew Lord of the Rings fan art every single day and like wrote fan fiction. And it was, it was fun because it was, I hadn't felt a creative spark in a little bit um, mm -hmm. since finishing this book actually. And that was the thing that kind of, I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> I can't make a job out of this. This is simply for fun, but it, I'm following it and it's letting me experiment with prose. I'm learning to draw in a different way and whatever is like giving you that spark is, it's so important to protect it. Um, and I think you have it a lot when you're a younger artist. And then when you get a little bit older, that spark starts to get very kind of rare. And so um, it's just something I'm always like trying to like, like cherish. It's just like a little flame where um, you have to kind of like give it wood and take care of it. And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, uh, that's really good advice. Um, I, I should remember that too. Um, yeah. William is asking if you, uh, for this book, drew inspiration from just Selkie legends or modern retellings or both, like how much did you get into other Selkie lore as you were working? Yeah, I, I pretty much just um, sort of like went from the common myth that I knew. I didn't actually do a ton of research and actually sort of in like preparing for this tour and stuff. Um, and a couple other things, I've just been doing more reading into Selkie legends and like finding some of the cool variants there's one there's one cool one where it's like a selkie was wronged she like her her human husband like was a fisherman and he like killed her seal husband and so she cursed this whole island so that like anytime someone like falls to their death from the cliffs it's like it's like that's like the selkie curse um so there's all these cool like variants that i didn't know about but yeah i didn't i sort of didn't really seek out a lot and i didn't there's amazing movies like the secret of ronan nish which i just watched recently and i was like oh this is <laughs> very good yeah. um embarrassingly i think i 
I just watched Splash again, which is a weird movie. And I'd only seen it when I was a kid, but I was watching it and I was like, oh, there's some very similar beats in this. I kind of <laughs> definitely stole some scenes. So that was a subconscious thing. <laughs> right. You didn't know it was still in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's Kelsey's also, it's just this kind of classic, like monster GF kind of like, mm -hmm. like a uh, story that you see a lot where it just is like, what if this sort of magical creature is a cute person and they're in love with me, but like, they're not totally human. And that's, I think like, like a very compelling story. So Definitely. yeah. A actual fish out of water. Um, Literally, yeah. I, yeah. I think I can answer Emma's question, but why don't you tell us if this is a standalone book or will it be a series? Um, it's standalone. Yeah, it's, I really like stories to have a, an arc. And this one, I really, I really had an idea for like what the story was. And I kind of knew that from the beginning. And so, um, yeah, getting, getting to do it. I, I love the characters though, and I miss drawing them. So I'm like, I'm not ruling out like doing some short comics about them later, but, um, yeah. yeah, standalone for now. Ollie had asked how um, queerness informs the, the other elements besides like the story itself. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I love that question. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to answer like without pulling up the art, I think, but like I, like, I think my guiding, this is something I've like realized after making a bunch of books, but the guiding interest that I have in comics is empathetic storytelling and really putting, putting the reader into the character's shoes. And so that's not specifically a queer thing, but I think it, for the stories that I tell, it just feels very, um, it's just, I, I, it's like, it's all this like really ineffable stuff about how they're drawn, but just trying to draw them in a way where they, the reader can look at them and identify with the characters. Um, I think that like the classic example is like Tintin, who is this really um, simple design. Um, and you can really look at Tintin and like, like male or female, you can just sort of be like, okay, I'm like, I could be that little guy or like the bone characters in Bone by Jeff Smith. Um, really simple character designs. And I think like mine are not quite that simple, but it's still to have there be a little bit of universality to them. Um, where you can read yourself into them. And then I, I, it's also very interest, important to me to like, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Like, like show what the characters are experiencing and try to make that feel as real as possible. So something I love about prose is how tactile it is and how you can be in the head of the characters and really feel what they're feeling if they have like a sore or if their heart is broken, it can describe it in these really visceral language. Um, and uh, you can't do that with comics, but you can, like show that through the character, the body language and the facial expressions. And so um, that's like very much my interest when it comes to drawing. And I think like in terms of like making queer stories, uh, something I love also about drawing is just that you can take what you find beautiful personally and sort of show it in a way that shows that it's beautiful. Um, and so it's like, obviously these girls are like very conventionally cute, but still to be like, Kelsey is curvy. She like has all these freckles. She just has like all these things that I find so incredibly cute in a person. Um, and to be able to take that like, like love and adoration that I have and put it into the drawing mm -hmm. um, is kind of cool to, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's something really, really interesting about that. And like, mm -hmm. obviously this is like a, a YA book, but like, I think I sometimes, there's there's some amazing like like um erotica like Calmex like the smut peddler series and things like that that are very queer focused and I always think those are so inspiring because it's people being like here is a body type that I like and I'm going to show you like exactly what I find beautiful about it and it's often so outside the mainstream and I I'm, I just take a lot of inspiration from the way that art lets you do that yeah yeah I remember years ago like reading about like the female gaze mm -hmm. and being a little bit like I, I get that and then seeing a movie where it was I was like oh now I it, I mean there are some things where it's like visually you get it yeah it yeah and a big part of it for me is like like queer female gaze is like no one is ever just an object of desire like right. like Kelty is is not just a cute romance like <laughs> romanceable NPC to use like mm -hmm. a game term. She is, she is a full character with full desires. And even when Morgan tries to kind of put her into a box, Kelty very much rebels against that. And so to, to approach every character with the same amount of empathy is, mm -hmm. I, again, I don't think that's like specifically queer, but it's, it's very important. And I think you see it a lot in queer narratives. Yeah. To, for everyone to have full humanity. Yeah. Yeah. 
no matter how much dialogue they get. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely comes through. Okay. We do have to wrap up in a minute, but Ollie had uh, maybe, <laughs> I probably missed a couple of questions, but um, I really enjoyed the question from Ollie about who uh, has the bigger himbo energy, um, Legolas or Aragorn. <laughs> opinion on this I feel unrelated like yeah I think I I vote my vote's Legolas um okay. do you agree with me yes I mean I have a little too many feelings about Aragorn anyway so I <laughs> Legolas my I favorite I'm like such a, a Tolkien scholar at this point but my favorite thing is that everyone would uh when the books came out everyone would draw Legolas as like this live like twinky little guy and Tolkien had to write a letter and he was like Legolas is very strong he is very tall he can do anything he wants like he is not like a twink <laughs> um, and so I I Legolas is definitely himbo energy did you read that thing that uh, Orlando Bloom said when the movies were shooting and he said he was trying to like make him like a cat and, <laughs> and if you watch that with that in mind it's kind of hilarious it's like, he's like um having worked at like a live action role-playing summer camp like he in those movies I'm like you look exactly like a 10 year old boy who is LARPing as the coolest character in the world and like he's all in his head um I love it <laughs> I know I think the fact that all those actors are so into it really I mean it gives a lot to those movies <laughs> Why does every panel on Mon turn into a Lord of the Rings panel? I mean, I'm yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to. There's so much. Oh, well, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you to Toronto Comics Arts Festival for having us. I think Callie is going to say a few words before we officially sign off. But Molly, thank you again for sharing The Girl from the Sea with us. Everybody, please get a copy. It's the book of the summer <laughs> and the year. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I just, I love this convention so much. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be here and I, I can't wait to start meeting, like start having events again and meeting people in person. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Molly and Amanda. That was really awesome. Uh, you can find Molly's new book, The Girl from the Sea in the Scholastic Publisher booth in the TCAF marketplace at torontocomics.com. And thank you everyone who attended today's event. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge and thank our programming sponsor, who is Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. They also have a virtual booth in the TCAF marketplace, so please check them out. A special thanks to the Beguiling Books and Art and page and panel, the TCAF shop. And TCAF wouldn't be possible without government support from Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Art Council. And to close, I just wanted to highlight one upcoming panel, which is tomorrow night, Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's called Body Image in Comics. It's not easy to feel comfortable in one's own body, but redrawing the body into comics is another challenge entirely. How do you draw a body you're not especially comfortable in or that others don't understand? This panel features Marie Noel Hibert, creator of My Body in Pieces, Kimoko Topimatsu and Keith Geniza, creators of Kimiko Does Cancer, and Eloise Shoshua, creator of The Body Factory. And we have so much wonderful programming to share this week, so please follow us at Toronto Comics for all of the information and updates. Thank you.